Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2021 Reverse Pitch EPRI AI meeting. We are so excited to have you here for the next four days. We have a lot of really great information to share, but before we dive in, I just want to um, give Jeremy Renshaw from EPRI a chance to give you a little bit of background on all things EPRI and AI. Jeremy, over to you. Hello, thanks, Hannah, and welcome to this EPRI and Stanford co-hosted event. This is the third in our series of events this year to bring together the AI and electric power communities to work towards solving challenges. And this is an event that is likely very different from any other you have been to in the past. This is not an event where you come to listen and learn. This is much more an event where you come to learn and get involved in solving the greatest and biggest challenges facing the AI and electric power industry today. So as you listen to the speakers that we have for you throughout the week, we encourage you to think about how you can get involved and become a catalyst for the transition to the energy system of the future. So we're very excited to put on this meeting for you this week. And in fact, Neil Wilmshurst, who you'll hear from in a minute, was so excited to be here that even falling off a ladder over the weekend couldn't keep him away. So we hope that you can match his engagement and enthusiasm in the meeting. So Hannah, back to you. Thanks so much, Jeremy. All right, guys, before I pass it over to our first keynotes, we just want to go over a few housekeeping items about this awesome platform that you guys are on. Um, feel free to leave any chats or comments. We want to make sure that this is very interactive. Um, we do have some people on the back end who are going to help monitor that chat and Q&A panel for us. You will see a poll pop up. Um, we want to make sure that we get you guys involved and uh, and interactive right from the beginning. So if you don't mind, go ahead and filling out the first poll and what year will AI take over the world? Uh, these sessions will be available for uh, on-demand use after um, each meeting each day. Uh, so check back here tomorrow for the on-demand from today. Okay, I think that's enough housekeeping. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it, out, pass it over. Our first keynote is Neil Wilmshurst from EPRI. Neil, over to you. Well, Hannah, good morning and thank you very much um, for the opportunity to kick this week off. And thank you to all the attendees for your participation as well. So what I'd like to do now is just do some brief introduction to EPRI. And I'm wondering, can, is the slide available? There we go. Okay, so some of you on the call today will know who EPRI is, some of you won't know who EPRI is. So I thought I would introduce EPRI to you, the Electric Power Research Institute. We're an independent, not-for-profit research organization who we work with members of the electric industry. And our role, very, sim very simply, is to understand the problems which our stakeholders face and actually connect them with solutions in the industry. So our role is really to accelerate that deployment of those solutions to connect with the problems our stakeholders have. So moving to the next slide. Yeah. EPRI, we do research in many areas, and this chart here shows you those areas, nuclear, generation, power delivery and utilization, that's the transmission, distribution, and end use of electricity. And also we do work in the technology innovation scope, which is actually that longer term research and development, which really gets us to where our artificial intelligence work is being conducted. We have, as it says here, over 450 participants from around the world from uh, maybe more than 30 countries. So we have a broad outreach across the world and it's really that um, outreach which enables us to draw together this collaborative of our members and stakeholders to try and engage today with the AI community to move the ball forward. Okay, so the question we get now is why AI and why now? So AI, I think, as we're all aware, has had a number of false starts. Maybe there's been one too many movies about AI. Maybe there's been expectations ahead of the technology. 
But today, I think we're in a situation where technology has caught up so that AI is actually moving forward. And there is expectations out there for AI and people engaging in AI. And so the time has, I, I believe, come for AI to really be deployed in electric industry. And why now in electric industry? Think about climate change, recent announcements, and the rapid transition of electric industry in this era of addressing climate change. This transition is going to happen rapidly. It's going to be deployment of new technology. It's going to be deployment of new techniques. And it's going to involve many, many new people either transitioning within the industry or new people coming in the, into the industry. So how do we, as the electric industry, play our vital role in that climate change transition and do it affordably, safely, equitably, and quickly. So AI has a big role to play in here. As I look at the people side of this, I have a very simple model, um, which is proficiency of people is, an, is a combination of training and experience. We can train people in this transition. We can bring new people in through new college courses, but where do they get that experience from? Is AI part of the equation to help people's experience accelerate through this transition? So EPRI has started AI.EPRI, our initiative. There's three pillars in this initiative. These three pillars are to convene the AI electric power community. And you'll see this, this is one of those events today, hosting events, discussing events, fostering relationships and bringing people together to bring the AI community and the electric industry together. The next one is data collection, curation and sharing. The electric industry is awash with data. There are sensors everywhere, there are reports, there is input. How do we best leverage all that data to improve solutions, help enable development of AI and move that forward? So EPRI is pulling together key data sets. We call them the EPRI 10 to actually help accelerate the deployment of AI. And then the third pillar is simply to deepen the AI experience across electric industry. There's big expectations. There's been a number of false starts, as I said before, maybe a few too many movies about AI. We need to bring the reality of where AI is and what the capabilities are to the industry so that we can all move forward together. So what is the reverse pitch? Um, this is the whole um, aim of this week. So I mentioned earlier, EPRI's role, I often simplify as our role is to connect problems and solutions. We stay aware of what our members and stakeholders need, the problem. We stay aware of what the industry and academia is developing, the solution. And normally it's the solutions are pitched to the people who need the solution. So what we're doing here is simply turning that through 180. We're allowing the people with the challenges, the problems, the opportunities, however you care to look at them, to pitch those to the solution providers and see if we can make those connections. So that is what the reverse pitch is all around today and the rest of this week. So I thought I'd round out my comments by talking about what AI means to me. And when I think of AI, I actually think about TMI and depending your generation, your background or whatever, TMI can mean many things. My guess is that some people on the call refer to TMI as too much information. And I can tell you that is a role of AI, getting through all those mounds of data, reports and everything else and finding those insights. So there's huge opportunities for AI to help us with that TMI um, challenge. 
But as some of you on the call know, that my view of TMI is somewhat different. A few years ago, I was part of a team from the UK that was involved in doing due diligence in purchasing Three Mile Island. And so some of us on the call, Three Mile Island means TMI. The TMI accident many years ago now was actually, if you study it, caused to some level, yet yeah, human error was there, but the human error was in part caused by overwhelming information. Nuclear plants are very complicated, lots of sensors, lots of information coming to the control room. And when the event began, the control room was just overwhelmed with information. Sensors setting off indications, setting off alarms, and there was really little, if any, prioritization in what was important. And the operators in the control room could have prevented the accident if they'd been actually able to see what was going on in the middle of all the information they were being bombarded with. So that's just another idea to think about the power of TMI in both contexts. Too much information at Three Mile Island. And then really what I want to talk to you about is my experience at TMI. So we um, bought Three Mile Island, the plant that didn't have the accident, Three Mile Island Unit 1. And when we went there, I got to stay at the plant at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania, and I got to know how that plant operated. And there was one key person at that plant, a guy I'll call Mike, who was the plant manager. Now, Mike had been at the plant for decades. I used to joke he knew every piece of equipment on that plant, every pump, every motor, every valve, every nut and every bolt, and he knew them better than his family. And Mike could walk around the plant and he just knew the state of the plant instinctively by the smell in a particular room, by the tone of a pump, by the vibration of a pipe. And he actually could put that in context with things he had read, things like the availability of other power stations, even the weather in that particular day, the availability of spare parts, who was available to do maintenance that day or that week. And Mike managed to single-handedly really control that plant and make it really safe, really um, um, reliable, but it was all done through the power of this one person who just had this instinctive understanding of the plan. So that's great, Mike was wonderful, but he was one guy who luckily never took vacations. He was in that plant seven days a week, but the, fa the, the, the flaw in this strategy was Mike actually did retire. So, my view of AI really is, is there a way to actually replicate what was happening in Mike's mind, those instincts based on the information flows, the knowledge of all the contextual things that are happening around him, to generate ultimately a decision assistant for plant managers on operating nuclear plants or other technologies. You could stretch the same analogy to the operators of the power grid. They're making judgments all the time around how best to keep the grid stable. Is there a better way to do that using AI rather than just relying on people's judgment and instincts? So that's my vision for AI as we go forward. Moving forward, with the technology that we have available now, with the techniques we have now, incrementally with easy wins along the way to gain confidence, moving not to replace people, not the iRobot movie, but to actually come up with a decision assistant to help people operate these assets more effectively, more reliably going forward. And in my mind, it's never been more important than now in this rapid transition we're in with 
what's going to be new technologies and new people where we don't have the luxury for people to actually gain that experience over time or through making errors. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to Hannah, but I just want to thank you all very much for being here today. And hopefully we can together move forward to somewhere close to my vision of what AI could or should be. Thank you very much, Hannah. Great, thank you so much, Neil. Um, before we pass it over to Miriam, I just want to remind everyone to please use the Q&A. We have um, some EPRI folks on the back end who are helping to monitor that. We will have time for some Q&A um, at the end of this keynote. Thank you very much, Neil. We are going to pass it over to Marianne Walk. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm Marianne Walk. I'm the Deputy Lab Director for Science and Technology at Idaho National Laboratory in Idaho Falls, Idaho. And I'm here to tell you a little bit this morning about artificial intelligence applications at INL. So we will do that by starting a little bit with an introduction of Idaho National Laboratory for you and talk a little bit about our current efforts in artificial intelligence and machine learning at INL. It'll be a little bit of a whirlwind tour that covers activities surrounding nuclear power plants, some digital twin things we're working on, and some of our cybersecurity activities as well. And then we'll end with looking forward towards the future with what we view as uh, INL's role in artificial intelligence and machine learning. So let's start with uh, just a few words about Idaho National Laboratory for those of you who are not familiar with it. We are the Nuclear Energy Research and Development Laboratory for the Department of Energy within DOE's 17 Laboratory National Lab System. Our vision is to change the world's energy future and secure its critical infrastructure through nuclear energy and clean energy technologies, as well as infrastructure security. We have about a $1.5 billion budget per year. And as you can see from the slide, it is primarily uh, funded by the Office of Nuclear Energy, about $850 million per year. We have a very large national security component, which includes non-proliferation activities. And I will talk a little bit about how we're using digital twins in non-proliferation in a few minutes. We also have a, uh, about 500, 5,500 employees at Idaho National Laboratories who are involved both in research and development and also in operations. One of the unique things about INL is that we have an 890 square mile site to the west of Idaho Falls, which is owned by the Department of Energy, where we do development and demonstrations of technologies, both nuclear and cybersecurity related. So this gives us the opportunity to go from fundamental research and development through demonstration at our laboratory. This slide shows the five different technical areas in which we have our staff organized. They run from nuclear science and technology through energy and environment science and technology and national homeland and security science and technology. Our artificial and machine intelligence and machine learning staff are primarily located in our advanced scientific computing area within nuclear SNT. And many of our applications for AI and ML are in nuclear technology, although we have activities also in energy and environment and national and homeland security. The other two categories that you see on this slide, the advanced test reactor and materials and fuels complex, those are large demonstration and areas out on our site where we do nuclear and other types of uh, activities for the laboratory. So we'll be talking primarily about our, our work in nuclear science and technology and national and homeland security today. Before I go specifically to AI and ML, I want to finish up the discussion about INL, talking about our strategic initiatives. As I mentioned earlier, we are focused on the low carbon energy future for the nation. And we are doing that through five interconnected strategic initiatives. And all of these use AI and ML, in fact. We have two related to nuclear energy. Those are the orange and red circles, one on reactors, other on fuel cycles. 
Then the, those are pointed towards our Integrated Energy Systems Initiative, in which we're looking at all energy sources producing both electricity and heat to produce things like hydrogen, desalinate water, create chemicals in a new type of system, uh, power system for the future. These are supported by the Blue Circle Initiative, which is our Advanced Manufacturing and Materials Initiative for extreme environments. And finally, we surround the entire spectrum with our Secure and Resilient Cyber Physical Systems Initiative. And all of these initiatives use AI and ML in some respect. So now let's go a little bit more towards artificial intelligence and machine learning at INL specifically. We've started a community of practice of AI and ML at INL, and we're, it has, as I mentioned, a variety of different applications. And primarily, we are looking at applying AI and ML techniques to our mission or our mission goals. So we're not so much about creating fundamental AI and ML research at INL, though we do some of that, but we're primarily use, looking to apply it to different problems. And you'll be hearing about that in a few minutes. Our goals, of course, include methods, data, tools, people, and security. So, so an entire gamut. We're very interested in trustworthy AI, AI ML for our applications. For example, we have invested in creating an agile computing infrastructure, adding a new specific computer for our AI and ML uh, applications just last November. And we're investing in people as well. We are also investing in uh, webinars and symposia that are attracting a large number of staff each month, looking at different AI and ML topics, including nuclear, defense topics, trustworthy AI, digital engineering, and the like. And EPRI has participated in some of those seminars. So now moving along to some example applications. Let's start with some nuclear, because that's what INL is really all about, is nuclear energy. So we work quite a bit with the Office of Nuclear Energy on AI and ML projects. And here are a couple examples. The first one I'll talk about is a digital twin example where we are looking at the piping systems in nuclear plants. And we've created a model of those piping systems coupled with data to create a cycle of how training AI algorithms to manage intrusion and corrosion of piping. So the idea here is we can reduce the amount of physical labor that we need to do in order to assess the, uh, how the pipes are doing in the plants. And so we can then reduce cost of operating the plants. This particular project is funded by the light water sustainability part of DOE. So we are, have a large program working on keeping our current fleet of nuclear reactors uh, competitive and that involves reducing costs. And so we're trying to use AI and ML to do that. Another area in which we're working on AI and ML is risk-informed condition-based maintenance. So we're using some natural language processing techniques to classify work orders, and we're developing metrics using AI and ML techniques as well to support predictive maintenance. Again, all pointed at reducing the cost to operate the plant. Additional applications within our nuclear power plant portfolio include computer vision and deep learning using those techniques to do things like identifying fires, uh, to automate reading of gauges, and even to fly drones around inside nuclear power plants so that we can reduce the number of times people have to go inside the plant and reduce the inspection time, do this remotely and automatically. We are also working on condition monitoring to detect anomalies earlier using unsupervised ML techniques. And finally, we're improving processes and reducing cost by using natural language processing on assessing inspection and, uh, and optimizing inventories in plants as well. So all of these are aimed at reducing the amount of money that we need to use to operate our current fleet. And we're doing it using artificial intelligence and machine learning. And we're doing it in combination with industry as well. 
So now let's talk a little bit, shift gears a little bit and talk about nuclear nonproliferation. We have uh, many nuclear plants across the world, over 400, and they are have safeguards associated with them to, in order to make sure that we don't proliferate uh, nuclear materials across the world. And this is done with the International Atomic Energy Agency or IAEA. So as we develop new nuclear technologies, nuclear plant technologies, we need to understand diversion scenarios and misuse scenarios in order to try to prevent that and make sure that we can um, we can keep our proliferation regime in, in check. So we have been working with the IAEA and with the National Nuclear Security Administration in order to develop a digital twin for a sodium cooled fast reactor design that will be part of the next generation for nuclear power plant uh, landscape. And we've been doing that uh, with, I have a video to show you about this and this will take about three minutes. And so I hope you enjoy learning a little bit more about how we're using artificial intelligence to create digital twins to uh, in non-proliferation applications. So let's watch the video. American companies and the U.S. Department of Energy are investing in a new generation of nuclear reactors that will provide abundant energy while also reducing carbon emissions. DOE is funding two sodium-cooled fast reactors. The versatile test reactor to accelerate the testing of advanced nuclear fuels, materials, instrumentation and sensors. And natrium, a power reactor that will be coupled with a molten salt energy storage system to provide flexible output to the electric grid. And small mobile micro reactors are set to be deployed through the National Reactor Innovation Center. These promising new technologies could drastically improve the quality of life for people around the world. But they also pose new challenges for agencies detecting and guarding against proliferation. The International Atomic Energy Agency ensures countries are meeting their non-proliferation treaty obligations to use nuclear material only for peaceful uses. The agency's 250 inspectors routinely visit and inspect the 400-plus nuclear power reactors operating worldwide and other nuclear facilities. The number of inspections are expected to grow as next-generation technologies come online, which will add to the IAEA's workload. But their budget has been zero growth for decades. Emerging technologies such as digital engineering and digital twinning could help address these challenges. Because digital twins are virtual representations of physical infrastructure, these models could use machine learning and data analytics to detect whether nuclear materials are being diverted or facilities misused for weapons. The digital twin incorporates simulated operational data through a serpent physics model which is persisted into an ontological model and data warehouse called Deep Links. Virtual experiments of potential diversion and misuse scenarios can be explored and their indicators identified. The system analyzes data indicators using machine learning to sift through data and flag potential problems. Once combined with operational data from the facility, the digital twin can remotely and continuously monitor day-to-day -day operations of a facility for misuse and diversion. This technology could greatly reduce the burden on IAEA inspectors, while also increasing the effectiveness of safeguards to draw timely conclusions and respond to indicators. This prediction gains accuracy as additional data streams from acoustics, visual, and database logs are fused into the digital twin data infrastructure. This digital twin could reduce the learning curve of new technologies and designs for diversion or misuse paths, while also continuously monitoring for anomalies, aiding the IAEA and its inspectors in their work. Only with a digital twin can we technically explore the diversion or misuse scenarios, identify indicators, and automate detection. No facility operator is going to allow you to be the bad guy at their facility. Using Digital Twin for autonomous, real-time monitoring will have a huge impact on both reducing resource impacts on the strained IAEA inspectorate, as well as making the safeguard much more effective and efficient.
So there you have it with regards to using digital twins for nuclear nonproliferation. That's one of very interesting application of AI and ML that we are perce uh, pursuing. I have one more nuclear uh, application that I'll discuss and then we'll move on to cybersecurity. This last one is a data fusion example where we are looking at data from the high flux isotope reactor at Oak Ridge. And this is a project in which we are uh, collaborating with Oak Ridge, funded by DOE, to collect a large diff amount, different types of data, including infrasound, seismic, acoustic, thermal, and other, in order to understand what can we tell remotely outside from outside of nuclear facilities about nuclear operations. And in this case, the INL role is to collect infrasound data using smartphones and put run it through the cloud and see how can we identify operation events occurring at a nuclear facility. So that's just another example of how we're using AI and ML in order to improve our operations and understanding of our nuclear power plants. Now let's move on to our thinking about cybersecurity. First, we'll talk a little bit about wireless security. INL has started a wireless security institute. It was launched just a year and a half ago to lead and focus national security research on 5G. So we want to apply AI and ML to look at wireless security in particular, and we're going to look at it in four different aspects. First, we'll look for detecting attacks. How can we use AI and ML in order to detect attacks on the 5G networks? We want to identify and classify various types of wireless signals that we might be observing, look for device signatures, and finally, we want to enhance the secure spectrum sharing that we need to have for 5G applications. Clearly, wireless security is incredibly important as we move forward with the nation's communications future, and we're part of that through AI and ML at INL. Next, let's talk a little bit about more pernicious cybersecurity threats themselves. I've got two example projects where we will be talking about how we're using AI and ML to look at threats that are attacking our cybersecurity. So this project is called GeoThreats Observables, and it's funded by the Department of Energy. And what we're doing here is looking at missing threat relationships we're taking a variety of different types of data and look, loading them into a graph database, and then we're putting it onto a GIS platform. And what this allows us to do is to map these threats on a GIS platform, different layers, and put them using these graph techniques, we're able to do particular uh, cyber scenarios to see how we could respond to them and look at real world threats and so we can provide shareable, actionable, and implementable threat analysis for the nation. And so this is a really exciting application that we're doing on cybersecurity. Another one is called Firmware Command and Control, or FC2. So here we're doing um, using machine learning on reversed engineered binary code, very exciting, in order to baseline and model some firmware and so we can identify very quickly bad code in, in libraries. And so that blue circle that you see here on this slide is an example of some code in a, that, that has like 248 different aspects to it. And there were about two of them that were malicious that were inserted in there. And this particular code was able to identify it within minutes rather than the weeks it would have taken if it was done manually. And so this is a great application of ML. And it also helps us uh, identify the attack surfaces that these cyber attackers are using on our systems and be able to map that so that we can use to provide appropriate response. And this is a, a grid modernization laboratory consortium project that is funded by the Department of Energy. and it is collaborative with a variety of national laboratories, as well as industry partners. And so that's another example of how we're using AI and ML techniques on cybersecurity. So what are the, some of the 
opportunities that we have in power production to use AI and ML. We've, this slide shows some of the needs, some of the gaps, and then some of the future directions. So the needs are, are, are listed there. Online data reconciliation, we definitely need to have verifiable data, uh, data fusion, scalable solutions, those types of things are all needed. But we think we can use AI and ML in the future for efficiency optimization, sensing technologies, uh, improving maintenance, and also plant health and optimization of power delivery and management strategies. So there's quite a bit of opportunity in the future for these technologies. And finally, I'll close with an example of how we could potentially use some things that we've already done in a broader sense using um, risk-informed degradation management of some of these passive components. So an example would be a pipeline. We've been working on pipelines in nuclear power plants. We can extend this to others in, to do fiber optical sensing in order to, for example, to look for external intrusions into piping systems or internal piping corrosion to reduce inspection and maintenance costs. And this can all be done with artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms as well as digital twin and then sensing. So that, that's the, uh, the message we have here this morning is that there are many exciting things going on at our national laboratories, including INL, with regards to artificial intelligence and machine learning that are appropriate and important for the power industry moving forward. And I thank you for your time and I'll turn it back over to Hannah. Great, thank you guys so much. We do have time for a few questions. I'm gonna start with Neil and then Marianne, I will come back to you. First, Neil, how can AI help with climate change? Okay, I think I touched on it a little bit in the um, presentation there. You know, this transformation of the electric industry um, as a whole is going to be rapid, is gonna be very, very different to where we've been. And in my view, we're going to hit the situation potentially where Three Mile Island was for the accident. We're gonna have an overwhelming amount of data. And how do we find those insights? How do we maximize those insights? And how do we help people act on them? I'll give you an example. You have that team managing an electric grid which is gonna be so much more complicated than it is today with all those different assets connected. You have solar panels, wind turbines, nuclear power plants, gas plants, batteries, you name it. What are the best decisions to make moment by moment to keep that grid stable, which not only keeps it resilient and reliable and affordable, but also brings the lowest CO2 footprint to that grid solution? the level of complexity in those decisions is going to be way more than those grid operators face today. So that's one great example where deploying AI as that decision assistant is gonna be tremendously powerful. Great, thank you. Um, Marianne, you mentioned that INL is focused heavily on nuclear applications, and you also mentioned digital twins, computer vision, and condition-based maintenance. How long do you think it will be before some of these technologies are implemented in plants? Oh, that's a difficult question, and I don't want to speculate uh, too much on that. We're definitely in the research and development stage with that, but we need to move forward as quickly as we can in order to get these economically uh, uh, advantageous solutions into our plants. Certainly working with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is gonna be very important in order to get uh, their buy-in to using artificial and machine learning techniques on things like plant maintenance so that we can uh, decrease our costs by using these technologies. But we're working as quickly as we can on them, and uh, we will hope to get them implemented within the you know, next few to several years. Great, thank you so much. This is a question that um, I'm actually gonna use for both of you guys. So we'll start with Neil. 
Um, so we have three reverse pitch topics today. We're going to cover smart grids, asset management, and digital twins. Which do you think is likely to be the first area to really see progress made in terms of AI solutions? Okay, well, I'm impatient. I want all three. I can see the, the benefits in all of them. Um, but the, one of the things I've learned along the way, reading up on AI and being interested as we go forward is the important thing I believe for AI is to have early wins to gain that trust and that traction moving forward rather than reaching into the future for that big win. So I see the initial wins for AI in the electric industry around photo and image recognition. And that's where I see those early wins are there. The technology exists, traction is already being made. The electric industry across the entire spectrum spends tremendous time and effort inspecting things and recording the state of them, dispositioning things which seem anomalous. That the technology exists to actually do this automatically through image recognition. It's already being used in things like in medicine for screening um, um, for cancer. It's being used in some areas of industry screening um, radiographs and materials. Imagine a world where the electric industry broadly can reduce the man hours of people walking around, noting things down mm -hmm. and actually utilize those drones that Marianne talked about or whatever, and actually have this automatic recognition of anomalies through image recognition. I think that is where I see the earliest um, credible win going forward. Yeah, that's great, Neil. I definitely agree. Um, all right, Marianne, we're going to pass it over to you. Which do you think is going to be the first area to see real progress? You think smart grids, asset management, or digital twins? Well, I'm, I'm not a great predictor of things, but I, I like the digital twin uh, aspects. I think there's been quite a bit going on for quite a while in terms of this cycle of taking data uh, from real systems, moving it through um, you know, modeling and simulation of systems and then feeding it back, this sort of virtuous cycle. And the, we've done in the tech world a lot of this over the years for many years. And so I think it's ripe to really be applied. I'd also like to say a couple of things about machine learning. I, I think that I agree with Neil that that's you know, looking for patterns uh, in images, but also in time series data. Uh, machine learning has really had tremendous success in a variety of different types of uh, applications using time series to pick out signals out of high noise environments, for example. Uh, it's been tremendously um, successful in other applications, and I think it can be done very well in, in the, the energy industry as well. So those are my two picks, the, uh, the machine learning and then also the digital twins. Great, okay, we're gonna pivot back to Neil here. Neil, you mentioned that AI has had a number of false starts until the technology caught up. What is a different, what is different this time to prevent having another AI winter? Okay, great question. And I think there's two aspects to this. One is, that technology has actually moved forward since, since the previous times we actually started talking about AI. Computing power is so much stronger than it ever was. And the understanding of those AI techniques are there. Also, tangible progress has been made in other industries and other places that show that AI does have a role. So I think we now have a situation in the electric industry where senior executives are looking at what is happening both within the electric industry and in other industries and recognizing that AI is credible, 
is going to deploy and they need to be part of it. And people are seeing the benefits from safety, from reliability, from economics of actually deploying AI. I think AI has moved from being the next neat toy to being something which is recognized as a real game changer for the industry. And I think that's only happened over the last five years. But the challenge as always is to manage the reality of the expectations. There's always a danger with AI of the capability being overhyped. And I think my perspective is let's keep focusing on those wins that are credible to keep building up the momentum to actually move forward. The worst thing this industry can do is actually pick up AI and run too fast and actually um, damage the credibility with the, with the senior leaders in the industry of these technology. That's awesome. Okay, great. We're going to pass it back to Miriam here. Um, you mentioned an overview of 5G technologies. How do you think that we can bridge the gap to get from where we are today to widespread use of 5G with AI? Well, that's a great question as well. I think the clearly there's infrastructure that needs to be um, improved in order to use the 5G to its full potential. We also uh, need to make sure that the security aspects of 5G and the this, this spectrum sharing in a secure way is important as well. So the secure, what we're focusing on at INL really is in terms of the, the whole security aspect and using ML is gonna be really important in doing that. Uh, I don't have a lot of the details on that, and some of those things are a little bit sensitive since we, they're security topics. So I think I'll stop there if that's okay. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, uh, this is a question for both of you guys again. Um, so we mentioned the need to work on the regulators and AI challenges. How do you propose best working with regulators from around the world to be able to gain their trust and buy-in for implementing AI in the electric power industry. Neil, we're gonna start with you. I thought you'd start with me. I see a pattern coming in. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think I'm in danger of recycling the same soundbite, but it all comes down to confidence in the capabilities and confidence that we're not running too fast. And my picture, when I talked about my friend Mike at TMI, I very deliberately said decision assistant, not decision maker. And I think that is the first step around deployment of AI. That AI doesn't become autonomously deployed in these sensitive areas. It becomes part of the decision making assistant construct. So there's still a human who's knowledgeable and experienced in the loop, if you like, with a veto button. And I think that is going to be key as we move forward in the confidence of AI, keeping credible human experienced involvement in these decisions that are being made. And so showing the regulators the benefit is going to be the most important thing. And that's going to be stepwise, gradually showing what's possible, showing how it's reliable, and then moving the boundaries as experience grows. Great. Okay, Marianne, what about you? Well, I, I couldn't agree with Neil Moore on this. This is extremely important. And the fact that the artificial intelligence is an inform, you know, informs us doesn't necessarily make decisions for us, but that it actually is an, a helper and assistant. I think with dealing with uh, regulators like the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, they're very technically adept, very technically knowledgeable. Uh, it's important to be very transparent with what we're intending to do, what kind of uh, technologies we want to use and bring them along with us as we move to get to the point where we can actually use these technologies in the nuclear power industry 
we need to make sure the NRC is engaged every step of the way with us and, and that we keep them informed and uh, knowledgeable as we move forward. And as Neil mentioned, confidence is key. Great, okay, cool. Okay, uh, last question, we're gonna head over to Neil first and then we'll circle back to you, Marianne. Um, what is the biggest thing that can help the AI and electric power industries to work together more effectively to, to accelerate adoption of these technologies? Okay, that, that's a really good and a really important question, which I think could be that backdrop or the elephant in the room to some of the discussions this week. Something which has been, and it relates back in some ways to Marianne's presentation. And it's the, really the issue of cybersecurity and the current sensitivity around sharing data. Many of the electric um, capabilities in the industry are very, by necessity, very sensitive to cyber intrusion and actually, as a result, very protective of their data. The other side of that is in order for AI to deploy and to be successful, it needs access to that data. So I think that what, one of the real elements that needs to be carefully considered and resolved is this sharing of data, access to data, security of the data during the AI deployment. And some of the experiences I've had um, so far with trying to work with AI at EPRI is the real difficult time for this data issue is during the development and the piloting and the testing, because the compelling reason to actually do that isn't there. You're trying something which is uncomfortable, which is new, and there's this reluctance to open the box to share data for a trial which has no tangible benefit yet. So I think this whole issue of data sharing, data security is going to be fundamental in this AI in this AI electric in collaboration. Great. Okay. And last question for you, Marian. Um, what is the biggest thing that can help AI and the electric power industry to work together more effectively to accelerate the adoption of these technologies? Right. Well, I think. Clearly, Neil is correct with regards to data sharing. That's extremely important. And one of the things that we've learned with our cybersecurity analysis is that we can do much better determinations of the threat that we have if we are able to fuse data from a large variety of sources. I think with regards to implementing operational efficiencies and other things in uh, power plants and in the power industry, one thing that's really key for a national laboratory is to be able to partner with those industrial partners in order to get the data, but also access to some facilities to do testing, bring the industrial partners out to our laboratories to work with our test platforms as well, and with our scientists and engineers in order to make sure that we are approaching the problems that will have the impact for the industry. So really, uh, industrial partnerships between the laboratories and universities as well and the industry is what's going to accelerate the application of these technologies so that they are ready to be used in the industry. Great, awesome. Okay, well that was a great first session guys. Thank you to both of our keynote speakers. I think we got a lot covered. We are going to take a 36 minute break or so right here. Um, we're going to have some background music playing and there will be a countdown on the screen. So feel free to go grab another cup of coffee, use the restroom, answer some emails. We'll be right back here at 1030 a.m. Eastern time. Thank you guys very much. We'll see you here soon.